So it's, it's really a great honor and a pleasure to, to be here and to be given the opportunity to acknowledge the tremendous influence that John Clark has had in this entire field of uh, quantum superconducting circuits, and in particular, in the activities of our Quantronics group in, in France. So um, I was uh, very lucky 33 years ago to be a postdoc in John's group. And at that time, I worked uh, with Fred Wellstood in exploring uh, the possibility to use uh, DC squid as quantum limited amplifiers, for example, for uh, uh, gravity waves antennas. That was an idea, idea that John was uh, developing. So for that, we had to characterize the, the noise properties of, of squids uh, down to very low temperatures, uh, 20 millik. And in doing so, we, we discover that uh, below 1k, the excess uh, 1 over f uh, noise uh, of the system increased when lowering uh, the temperature. That was strange. But what was even more surprising is that um, all the devices uh, that were pretty different with different geometries and materials show at very low temperatures, more or less uh, within a factor of two, the same kind of noise. <laughs> so at that time, we, we didn't really understand the origin of uh, that noise. We had some, um, some speculations about the origin. But um, it took, in fact, uh, to the community uh, about 30 years to understand where uh, this uh, noise was uh, originating. And uh, you will hear about this uh, in the next two talks by Fred Wellsuit and Robert McDermott. I have to say that uh, at that time, I, I, I didn't really guess that uh, this uh, flux noise would be important in the future development of the field that was just starting with, of uh, quantum circuits. And I left uh, Berkeley quite frustrated, in fact, because uh, we hadn't understood the, the problem. It, it was not really a lot of, of progress. And I promised to myself to never again measure low frequency noise. Okay. <laughs> okay. And it's, it was also frustrating because uh, there were other projects going on in, in the group uh, of John, like uh, M MQT and uh, quantization, energy quantization, uh, quantized levels in Josephson Junctions with, uh, that uh, Michelle mentioned. And there was another experiment that uh, was uh, very interesting to me that uh, John was uh, carrying out in collaboration with the uh, late uh, Erwin Hahn. And this was the de uh, detection on nuclear spin uh, noise. And um, so the, the experiment was they, they had a sample containing chlorine spins that was placed in the inductor of a LC resonator, like this. And they measure the current fluctuations in this resonator using you know, DC squid. So the resonator was tuned uh, at around 30 megahertz uh, to be uh, at more or less the same frequency uh, that the nuclear quadruple resonance of the chlorine atoms uh, spins. Sorry. So and this is the spectral uh, noise of the, the current fluctuations in this circuit uh, as a function of frequency. And this is what you expect for a, for a uh, LC resonator noise. But for this uh, small bump here, that uh, you can see much uh, better here. Okay. And this uh, is, is um, showing, in fact, that uh, the spin system is emitting noise into the, uh, emitting photons into the resonator, okay, because of uh, fluctuations uh, induced by the, the current fluctuations in the, in the resonator. And I remember very well, and I'm ashamed of it, in fact, that during a group meeting, I was uh, very arrogant in, in saying that, listen, because you are seeing this uh, noise, it means that uh, the relaxation time of the spin has to be limited by this emission of photons into the resonator. And I remember that uh, John and Erwin Hahn uh, very gently explained me uh, 
the concept of radiation damping, in fact, that I had uh, mi misunderstood. And uh, th this, uh, this was a, a very good lesson for me. Okay. But what I would like to say is that uh, this, um, this um, rad um, radiation-limited lifetime of spins is an effect that does exist, okay? And this is called the Purcell effect, okay? When you put uh, the spins in a cavity which concentrates the, the field, okay, there is an increase in the emission rate of uh, photons by, by the spins, which is proportional to the quality, quality factor of the resonator, to the coupling uh, uh, energy between the spins and, um, and the resonator, and it's maximum when the two systems are in speaking terms, okay? They are at resonance. And of course, for this uh, nuclear spin system of chlorine atoms here, this, uh, there was some effect, but the uh, lifetime, uh, so the, the Purcell rate, rate uh, in, in that experiment was about, um, so the, the lifetime of the spins due through the, to the emission of photons into the resonator was of the order of 100 million years, in fact. Much longer than um, the non-radiative uh, decay of uh, spins like uh, the emission of, of photons, in fact. So what I would like uh, to show uh, just uh, very, very quickly here is um, an experiment that has been uh, performed uh, uh, in our group by Patrice Berthet and Audrey Bienfait uh, in the last uh, few years, which is on, not on nuclear spins, because it's difficult, but on um, electronic spins which really show this, uh, this effect. So this uh, personal effect is, uh, has already been seen in system with uh, electrical dipoles. But this, uh, uh, doing this with uh, magnetic uh, dipoles is, uh, is a little more difficult and has only been recently achieved. So what they have done is that they have used a lamp element resonator. So this is the inductor here, this uh, small uh, line. All this is aluminum. And this is an interdigitated capacitor. And this is uh, fabricated on top of a silicon uh, substrate in which uh, they have implanted bismuth uh, donors, each one uh, carrying a spin, in fact. So they can probe uh, the, the, the system by putting it in a um, 3D cavity like this one. And they, they probe the resonator, which has a very uh, large uh, quality factor here, which is a good thing to observe the parcel effect. And now, because the, the field is concentrated, and the, the, the magnetic field fluctuations are concentrated here along this uh, uh, small inductor, the, the coupling to the spins, which are really close by this, uh, this line here, uh, is strong enough, well, 55 hertz is what it was measured, to expect a large enhancement of uh, the emission of photons by the spins into the resonator. And um, these are the results. So this is the lifetime in logarithmic scale of the spins as a function of the frequency the tuning of uh, between the spins and the resonator. And you see that here at perfect uh, matching here, the lifetime uh, decreases by three orders of magnitude from the non-radiative uh, processes and uh, perfectly follows what is expected for the personal uh, limited uh, radiation. Okay. So th this, um, th what they think is that uh, by I forgot to mention this. Here the wire was uh, five micron uh, wide. So they think by, di by decreasing uh, the, the width of the, of the wire, they will uh, get a much larger coupling, in fact, and they will even increase further this uh, effect. And th this will be really helpful in the, in the spin uh, uh, community to, uh, to control uh, on a, the initialization of electronic spin uh, spins into their ground state for any experiment. So let me now switch to, to a different uh, noise problem. And this is uh, 
noise in an atomic squid. So as uh, was mentioned uh, by, by Michel, uh, most of the quantum superconducting circuits that we are using are based on Josephson tunnel junctions, but uh, those are not the only Josephson weak links, okay? And in fact, um, there is an elementary weak link that uh, consists simply on a single conduction channel connecting to uh, superconducting reservoirs. And when one applies a uh, phase difference between the two superconducting reservoirs, superconductivity here is frustrated, in fact. So which phase to choose? And the system responds to this um, frustration by changing locally here the density of states. And a discrete spin degenerate level appears with an energy within the superconducting gap between the ground state of Cooper pairs and the continuum of excitations. And the energy of this uh, so-called Andreev state here depends both on the transmission probability of this uh, conduction channel connecting the two reservoirs and on the phase difference applied between the two reservoirs. So now, uh, in this uh, very simple system, uh, uh, Josephson weak link, what are the microscopic elementary excitations of uh, lower energy? Well, first, you can add a single quasi-particle to the system, which can be of either spin. Okay. For that, you have to pay uh, the the of energy from the ground state. And then if, for example, by absorbing a photon, like this, one can promote from the Cooper pair condensate a Cooper pair into this Andreev state. So this is an excited uh, Cooper pair state. It, it costs uh, twice the, the Andreev energy because you have promoted uh, two quasi particles here. And so you see this, uh, this very simple system has um, a low energy uh, spectrum, uh, very, which is very simple. So we like to, to consider this uh, system as a quantum dot, like in semiconductors where one can localize uh, electrons. But here we, we don't have any physical barriers okay, between the superconducting reservoirs. It's just uh, the phase difference that localizes these quasi-particle states. So this quantum dot can be in any of these uh, three or four states, if you want, because this one is um, uh, doubly degenerate. So the ground state has uh, an energy, a uh, phase dependent energy, uh, like this, between zero and two pi. The even excited state, where we have promoted a Cooper pair into the Andreev state, has the, the opposite uh, energy, this. And these uh, two uh, spin degenerate states, uh, which are odd excitations of the system uh, don't have any phase uh, dependent uh, energy. So as long as the parity of uh, the number of quasi particles is uh, uh, conserved in the system, we can consider this uh, ground and excited state here as a two level system, as a true level uh, system. And the energy difference between these two states is controlled by the phase difference, of course, and it's minimum here at maximum frustration of uh, a phase of pi, and it goes down to a value which is controlled by the transmission probability for electrons through this conduction channel. And for perfect transmission, this energy should go to zero. Okay. So how do we explore this physics? For that, we use uh, atomic contacts that uh, we create using the break junction technique. So we start with a small aluminum bridge, which is suspended over two microns, more or less, on top of a flexible substrate, a plastic substrate. And then we clamp the substrate, which is here. We clamp it here on one side, and then we push with this uh, pusher here uh, that moves down on the substrate so as to bend it. 
And in doing so, we stretch the, the bridge here, which eventually breaks. And then by controlling, fine tuning the position of the pusher, we can control the contact between the two superconducting electrodes and create contacts of a few atoms or even one atom. So all this is attached to the mixing chamber of a dilution fridge. So it's at very low temperatures and it's under a cryogenic vacuum. So it's a, it's a clean system. So this is a French patissier artistic model of, um, of an atomic contact. Yeah, this is what we have every day for a tea time. Okay. So what is nice about these atomic contacts is that in fact they accommodate just a, a small number of <laughs> conduction channels. Okay. And um, this number corresponds to the number of valence orbital of the atom in the center. In, for aluminum, it's about three, a maximum of three. These atomic contacts are really stable. Once we create one, okay, we can keep it for weeks or months, in fact. And the nice thing is that with the very same sample, we can adjust by moving this up and down the transmissions of the different channels. And we can create situations in which we have just a single channel of very high transmission dominating all the physics. And it's what we want to, to explore. So we include, in order to, to probe this entry of physics, we include the atomic contact in a small superconducting loop so that we can phase bias the system when we apply a flux through the loop. So this is the atomic squid, and it's an RF squid, but it, even if you don't like RF squids, they, they can be useful. Okay. And to probe the, Andreev, uh, the configuration of the Andreev state, in which state this Andreev quantum dot is, we inductively couple this uh, RF squid to a microwave resonator, which uh, has a, a resonance frequency around 10 gigahertz. So this is uh, uh, schematics of the, the experiment. So in practice, we use a coplanar uh, quarter wavelength resonator uh, made out of uh, niobium, okay? And here, at the shorted end of the resonator, we have introduced, this is a zoom, an aluminum loop containing the break junction giving rise to the atomic contact. And then we can send uh, uh, measurement pulses around the resonator uh, uh, resonance frequency and measure the reflected signal and get the two quadrators of the reflected signal. And through the same port, we can also send a, a second tone to drive the transition between the two uh, Andreev uh, levels. So this is um, a typical uh, spectroscopy. So we, before each measurement uh, pulse on the resonator, we send a saturating pulse at uh, some uh, given frequency. And what we plot here is the amplitude of one of the quadrators of the reflected signal as a function both of the phase difference across the atomic contact and the frequency of this uh, second tone here in gigahertz. And what you see is this uh, V-shaped uh, line, which is a signal of the Andreev transition between the ground and the excited even state of the system. In fact, we can fit perfectly this, uh, this line. These are the dot and the dashed line here uh, with uh, the energy difference that we expect for these two states. And from this, we get a very precise measurement of the transmission probability of uh, the contact, okay, which in this case was uh, above 99%. So now, if we place ourselves here at a phase difference of pi, which is a sweet spot uh, where the system is um, is insensitive to first order to, to flux noise, to phase fluctuations, 
we can perform time domain measurements. And for example, we can measure after sending a, a pulse of pi and waiting for some time before measuring the state of the system, we can measure the relaxation back to equilibrium after this uh, pi pulse that uh, brought the system from the uh, ground state into the excited state. And in fact, what I am plotting here in, with these three different colors are the populations that we measure for the three possible states of the Andreev quantum dot. And you see this is the, the odd state is uh, most of, uh, more or less half of the time occupied, but it doesn't uh, change uh, with time. And this is the ground state population going back to equilibrium with a time constant of the order of uh, four microseconds. So uh, quite a long lifetime for a, for a microscopic excitation. So if we move away from pi, okay, and we measure this uh, uh, lifetime of the excited state, we see, uh, these are the data, okay, we see this very large increase in the relaxation rate when the Andrea frequency matches, or is it speaking terms, with the resonator frequency. And this is one, uh, once again, uh, manifestation of the Purcell effect, okay. We, we can also um, measure um, the coherence of uh, superpositions of the ground and excited state within this even, uh, 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 sorry, between the two even uh, states of the quantum dot. So for this, so we, we use uh, the tuned Ramsey oscillations with two pi over two pulses separated by a free evolution time. And as a function of the, this uh, free evolution time, we see the populations of the ground and excited state oscillate uh, and being damped with a time constant uh, of, of the order, of, for this particular contact, of the order of 40 nanoseconds. And we can get rid of part of the noise, at least of the low frequency uh, part of the noise, by using a uh, uh, a hand echo sequence by introducing here a pi pulse in the middle of the, the two uh, during the free evolution. And you see, we see in, in this case that uh, the coherence time of this uh, quantum superposition of uh, both states has a much longer uh, decoherence time, uh, at least uh, one order of magnitude above. So what uh, leads to the coherence in this system? Well, are, these are fluctuations in the uh, transition energy between the two Andreev states. And what governs that are simply the fluctuations on transmission and on the phase. So transmission fluctuations can happen in the system simply by mechanical vibrations of the system, and there are some. Substrate creep, we are using a plastic substrate, uh, uh, and this can slowly evolve in, in time. And also we can have atomic motion uh, close to the contact. One atom can jump from one side to another and change the overall transmission, pro uh, uh, transmission probability across the, this contact. And of course, phase fluctuations are due to flux noise in the system. So, we can uh, measure um, this uh, decoherence time by just following the line width, okay. just following the, the line width of uh, the spectroscopic uh, line as a function of the phase difference. These are the data here. And in order to, to more or less describe uh, this uh, behavior by this uh, green line, this green line is the superposition of the contribution of three um, uh, noise sources. For here at, perfect, uh, at a phase of pi, as the system is insensitive to first order to flux noise, we should be dominated by uh, transmission noise. So we have considered that there is a 
some kind of one over F noise of transmissions, and we have adjusted the value of this uh, transmission uh, noise, which is on this order here, to, to adjust the, the, the data here. But then when we move away from uh, phase pi, uh, we need to consider uh, white flux noise and one over F flux noise to, per, to try to, to explain this uh, particular shape here. Okay, with values that are quite reasonable and not unknown to the community. Okay. So we, we can look a little closely to this, uh, to these uh, sources of noise, we can sort out uh, the flux from the transmission noise by following the, um, the, the full spectroscopy line like this. You see, if um, there is a noise in transmission, this uh, V-shaped uh, curve will move up and down. Okay? This is the effect of a transmission change. On the contrary, if there is flux noise, this uh, V-shape will move horizontally. Okay? So by measuring at a fixed frequency the two resonance here and here for two different uh, values of flux, we will see if there is transmission noise that the, the two uh, lines move against each other or uh, apart uh, from each other. But if there is flux noise, they will move together to the left or to the right. So this is the way we can sort about uh, flux noise and um, transmission noise, and here are two plots. And look a again at this. These are, are almost 40 hours of, uh, of uh, measurement data. And so th that was very strange here. The, the, flux noise was, uh, the flux was drifting linearly in time and suddenly stopped after 15 hours. And we, here we just got uh, 1 over F2 noise. And this is the transmission noise uh, as a function of time, and you see the noise changes really in the fifth digit here over these uh, 30 hours. And what you see is that there are small discrete jumps from time to time in, in the system. So there is another uh, thing that uh, we can do is to use Ramsey fringes to follow the transmission noise so that we place uh, the system at a phase of pi and then perform Ramsey sequences like this with always the, the same uh, time delay here, and we sweep the, um, the frequency of the uh, second tone here. And you get these uh, Ramsey fringes, and by following carefully the position of this, um, this is like in atomic clocks, in fact, uh, by following the position of this uh, central line here, uh, one can follow the uh, Andreev uh, transition frequency and therefore the transmission uh, of the, the contact evolving in time. And you see this was done uh, for 16 hours and uh, so you once again see these small jumps in transmission uh, in the system. Okay, so let me conclude here. So my first personal conclusion is that never say never again. I am back measuring uh, low frequency noise. And uh, the science conclusion is that uh, I have shown you that it's possible to control the spin relaxation uh, by using a cavity. This is the Purcell effect. And also that uh, localized microscopic superconducting excitations can be really long-lived and uh, coherent in superconducting devices. And um, the perspective for this is, uh, well, one could, um, this is in some sense uh, a proof of concept of uh, an Andreev qubit. And an Andreev qubit is pretty bad, it's probably not technologically uh, relevant, all this, of course. But the, the, the physics is interesting because this qubit is very different from the other uh, superconducting qubits. As uh, Michel was uh, showing, the, the existing superconducting qubits rely on a collective electromagnetic variable of, uh, uh, of a circuit. Okay? Here, the information is stored in a microscopic superconducting excitation. And the other thing that uh, we are starting to explore is um, not with atomic contact, but with the indium arsenide nanowires, in which we expect uh, the, the, the degeneracy of the uh, spin um, uh, levels of these odd excitations in which a, quasi a single quasi-particle is trapped 
in the entry of quantum dot, this degeneracy to be lift. And what we expect is to be able to manipulate the spin of this uh, trap quasi-particle. So let me finish by, by thank you again, John. I think um, you, you have been a model for all of us, of course, and uh, in particular for the Quantronics group. Okay. You, we have learned a lot about the way of uh, doing science to be really rigorous, uh, taking care of uh, details. But also, um, we, we're, we're, we are very, very sensitive, uh, Daniela, myself, to, because you are a humanist, and that you are not afraid of young people, in the sense that um, you really uh, take care of uh, your young collaborators, and um, help them and push them even to, to become uh, good scientists and if possible, in better scientists than you. And this is, uh, doesn't happen very often. So with this, I also I would like to say that I have also enjoyed the, the warm and friendly atmosphere that you create in your group and that we enjoy a lot also, like uh, Dale was saying, all these uh, parties uh, at your home with good food and good uh, wine. And thank you very much, uh, John, for all that. Have, have you speculated about the origin of these fluctuations in the transmission? They are, they are small. I mean, let's say if it's a, 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 an atom would move around, you would expect a large change, but it's only such a small change in tau. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the question is, uh, what is the origin of this uh, small uh, uh, transmission fluctuations? Okay. Uh, if uh, these are uh, atomic motions, of course, it cannot be the central atom that is moving. Okay? This will change the transmission uh, on, on the first digit. What we have uh, uh, simulated, uh, in fact, are, um, is, is that, in fact, an atom moving 10 atomic layers away uh, from the central atomic contact will change the transmission by more or less this uh, amount. But uh, what are the rates of uh, this um, change of uh, atoms at very low temperatures in a system like this? We, we don't know. This is just uh, speculation. Christian, I I missed something important about the pulse sequences that you're using. So you, to, when you're looking at the population dynamics, so you, you had a saturating pulse and then a yeah, second pulse. For space, uh, right. for could, could you just repeat that so I understand what, <laughs> what the saturating pulse is doing and what frequency it has, what's no. happening? Yeah. Okay, let, let me put it perhaps, uh, let me find uh, here. So, in fact, uh, this is what we observe. If we keep on sending uh, measurement pulses without any driving uh, pulse uh, on, the, on the system, and these are the results of uh, 10,000 uh, measurement pulses where we have plotted here in the IQ plane, the two quadrants, okay, the results. And you see um, the, the results gather in three clouds each one representing the system being in one of the states, the ground state, here the excited uh, even state, and half of the time we get a quasi-particle trap in the system, are, we are in the odd state. So this is what I, we, we measure, okay? But then we can transfer population from uh, the, the ground state to the excited state by applying this second tone. Uh, a long time. And uh, we can, uh, for example, do these uh, Rabi oscillations. And the number of points in each one of these, uh, in each one of these clouds is uh, the population of uh, this state. This is what uh, we do. Okay. Let's thank the speaker again.